Thank you for inviting me again, and um, uh, this is going to be a little bit of kind of debate format. Although it's a it's a hard debate. We were we were assigned topics. You know, should we test more? Should we test less as far as dyslipidemia goes? And and I kind of fall somewhere in the middle. So, so we're going to talk about why is it reasonable to test uh, lipids. Um, I got to update with my resume too because I've been going up and down to Whitehorse for about eight, nine years now and, and uh, really quite like it. So my disclosures, relationship with commercial interests, I, I don't get grants and research money or anything like that. I, I do speaking, uh, not a lot, but mostly for um, osteoporosis uh, and then a bit around the new anticoagulants and hopefully I, I come across as non-biased. I don't do anything with any of the, the lipid drugs. In fact, it's funny, last year I gave a talk at this conference and, and I think there were spies in the audience because I, I talked talked about how statins were really the only the only evidence-based agent, and, and a couple days later, I had different reps from from other lipid companies saying, "Well, you know, you weren't following guidelines, and you you really gave inappropriate information and stuff." So I, I think the information I gave was appropriate. My conflict, and it's not really a conflict of interest. This whole week, I've been off, and um, I've been building a tree fort with the kids. And I have four kids, and and. Um, it's funny, we, we Googled tree forts, and you can imagine what comes up when you Google, Google coolest tree fort in the world. There's no way I can build any of those things. And the kids drew out what they wanted. They want elevators, and they wanted a zip line and a water slide. So the tree fort that's been built that I'm going to finish today looks more like the kids built it. So what, what are we sure about when it comes to the lipid uh, literature? We're really certain that people with established vascular disease get significant benefit from statin therapy. So the person who's had the stroke, the person who's had the MI, they have established vascular disease. We should use statins. Um, we're also sure that those that are at high risk of having an event, um, a vascular event, get at least moderate benefit from going on to statins. It's not this dramatic benefit. You're not cutting risk by 100% or anything like that. It obviously depends where you're starting at for risk. So if you're, you know, your risk is 30% or, or 20%, you're going to have the same relative risk reduction, but the absolute, or sorry, you're going to have the same uh, uh, relative risk reduction, but the absolute benefit will be, be bigger. So I tend to use numbers of about 1% to 3% is the absolute risk reduction for people that are high risk. <clears throat> Those that are low risk of a first vascular event um, get very little benefit. The, the old saying, we should put statins in the water supply, I, I really disagree with. Those low risk people aren't getting a lot of benefit. And lipid lowering agents other than statins don't, don't really give benefit. Um, there are no good trials, outcome trials, saying that other agents really will reduce events. In fact, there's some agents, they never really made it to market, that look great, they made your lipid profile dramatically better, but they caused heart attacks. So more things that we're sure about. We spend a lot on lipid lowering therapy, um, somewhere in the range of 140 million. This is going to come down substantially because, at least in BC now, with reference-based pricing and, and the push to get generic pricing lower, uh, the statins are going to be costing about 20% of the previous brand price, so they'll be lower. A full lipid profile in BC costs $21.31, so I think it is important when we're debating this to understand what we're thinking about spending on that 30-year-old patient that's asking for a lipid profile. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's significant. Uh, Apolipoprotein B, which I'll talk a little bit about, about 16 bucks, and a C-reactive protein is about $10. So what are we not so sure about? Um, is lowering LDL really important? There's all sorts of secondary prevention trials that show that the lower your LDL, the lower your event rate, but we don't have that in primary prevention trials. Um, it's mostly extrapolated data. So we don't really know in an evidence-based way or a strong evidence-based way where our target should be. Um, and you also get into this difficult question, is LDL a surrogate marker? You know, is getting that LDL lower really, really important? Because um, if so, then you'd think that any drug that lowers LDL would give benefit. But is it something in particular to the statin? Does the statin stabilize a plaque? And you know, the more statin you get, the lower your LDL. Well, maybe the more plaque stabilization just because of the higher dose of statin you're on. Nothing to do with the LDL. We don't really know. So there's still some questions out there. Yada, yada, yada. Why should we test lipids? So if this person had had their lipids tested, this wouldn't have happened. No, that's not true. That's um, uh, nothing to do with lipids, um, but uh, leprosy in case anybody's wondering. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, except to, so don't worry about the numbers here. Um, our calculators for risk are far from perfect, and 
as we go through life and get older, age tends to be the dominant driver of risk. So if you do a Framingham score on somebody who's 70, you know, most people are going to end up being high risk because they're 70. Um, people that are younger, the other risk factors like genetic risk or family history, if they're a smoker, what their lipids are like, what their blood pressure like is like, is much more important in that younger patient. Um, for determining risk than the person who's 70, where age again drives it. When you look at first myocardial infarct or cardiovascular event um, in younger people, cholesterol plays a big role. Uh, it does not play as big of a role in people who are older. So the, the CCS guidelines of who to screen, um, this is going to be kind of small to see, but men over 40, women over 50, um, unless there's other risk factors, and we kind of know all the risk factors, I'm not going to run through them, then you may consider screening at a, a younger age. Rationale for screening, um, the benefit to treatment, like I've already said, is lower than we think. Uh, we've really got to identify and target the highest risk people. Those low risk people are not going to get a lot of benefit. Uh, there's a, a study, and I, I won't bore you with all the numbers, but this checkup study done in 2007, and it, it kind of makes sense. We see this in our practices, or at least I certainly see it. When a patient knows their numbers and you've educated that patient, I think they make a more informed decision um, and they're more likely to, to be compliant uh, with therapy. Um, and this checkup study actually showed when you really inform the patient what's happening with them, um, what their risk is, their lipid numbers actually fall a little bit, um, and it, partly because I think they're more compliant with drug. Um, there's a great site, if anybody hasn't looked at this, I, I write it down, it's really, really good for patients. Uh, it's done by McGill University, it's non-branded, nothing like that. Patients can do it themselves or you can do it with them, it takes a minute, uh, chiprehab.ca. Um, and it's, it's a Framingham risk score tool, but it gives you much more information than just a Framingham number. You know, if you say to somebody, if I say to you, you're a patient, well, you know, your risk is 25%. Like, what does that really mean? Or your risk is 8%. You know, it's, it, numbers sometimes are hard to understand. Um, what this does, and I won't go through the mathematics of it, it uses all the same data as Framingham. It'll give you your cardiovascular age. So if you're 50, um, but you're cardiovascular system's older because of your risks. It might say, well, you're 50 years old, but your cardiovascular age is actually more like 57. There's data that shows that patients respond to that much more positively, or, or they sort of take the message, well, wow, my blood vessels are 57, but I just turned 50. So it's, it's another tool um, that gives them the same number, but in a different format. And this is great because it'll say, this is what your risk is now. This is what your risk would be if we lower your LDL. This is what your risk would be if we quit you smoking or if you get more active or if we do all these things we want to do. So they can actually see how their number will change. It gives them a nice printout, really, really easy to do. You put the data in in about 20 seconds. Rationale for screaming, uh, screening. <clears throat> um, Framingham and other risk tools, like I was saying, are far from perfect. The cut points that we use, kind of interesting, right? Like we use low risk, less than 10%, 10 to 20 for intermediate, greater than 20 for high risk. That's never been studied. That's really just expert opinion. Well, where are we going to set these cut points? Let's pick nice round numbers that everybody can remember. But there aren't actually outcome trials looking at that. Um, I think the goal is to use screening to um, really open up a discussion with the patient about all of their risks. History, uh, family history doubles your risk, you've got to remember, too. Um, lipid values, and this just changed just because I moved it over from a Mac to a PC, but lipid values mean uh, little in, in primary prevention, right, as my opponent will say, um, although we're not really opponents. Uh, <laughs> tar targeting that value is, again, not really ro based in sort of robust data. Um, even the lipid guidelines will openly say, you know, we've picked these targets, oh, I'll get somebody down to less than two um, if they're high risk. You know, none of that's really based strongly on outcomes. Most of the trials that, in fact, all of the primary prevention trials use fixed doses of statins. You know, you went on to 20 milligrams of this or 40 milligrams of that, um, and we saw if there was benefit. So actually targeting numbers, not as helpful. Um, actually, I want to spent five seconds on this. So um, testing, I think, and, and really the crux of my argument why I'd say we should test people or appropriate people is that it may help with compliance. Up to 50% of people in primary prevention um, stop taking their statin by the one-year mark. 
By the two-year mark, only about 25% of people are still taking it. So dramatic drop-off on this. And I'm going to extrapolate data a little bit here, but we see in perioperative literature that if people stop their statin before they go for surgery, they have a higher chance of having a heart attack. And there's some theoretical reasons why if you're kind of on and off your statin, you may actually make plaque a bit more unstable. So if, you, if somebody's going to take it, you really want to say, look, you've got to really try to stick with it long term. If you're taking it a few days a week or you're not really going to be compliant with it, you may actually be doing yourself more harm than good. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the targets because I don't have time, but you guys kind of know the targets. How I use screening. Again, I use screening to predominantly avoid pharmacotherapy, um, to really promote lifestyle change uh, as a tool to educate my patients, um, as a tool to identify those highest risk patients to target who I start in statin therapy. Uh, APOB, uh, great test for looking at overall risk, great test for following people up on lipids and it costs less. A bottom line for my practice, I screen appropriate patients only. Good question, when do you retest? Um, people's lipids do not change that quickly unless they've been put on a drug, an HIV drug, or something else that's gonna change it. For most people, they don't need to have an annual lipid test. Um, testing them every five years would be more than appropriate. Um, once you hit about age 60, 65, your lipid profile doesn't change much. Um, even if it changes 20%, it's not going to change your risk all that much. So, you know, you kind of hit 60, um, you probably don't need to keep retesting. Uh, I retest once if somebody started therapy just to show that there's effect to try to keep that compliance going. You could argue then maybe every few years, but, but um, not essential. Probably the biggest thing, you know, and, and people will say, uh, you know, you don't really need to test lipids. These primary prevention trials showed that it, it really didn't matter where you were starting at. If you were high risk, you got the same benefit if your LDL was five or if it was three. Um, you know, so why bother testing? I think practically, can you imagine sitting down with a patient and saying, okay, I, I want to put you on this cholesterol drug. I don't want to test your cholesterol because it's not going to change what we do. It, it's really practically hard to do that. And, and I think you can sort of intuitively see how that would lead to a lot of non-compliance. Well, I don't know, my doc didn't even test me, I, you know. That's it. So I, it, pretty short, we just have 15 minutes, but we'll have time for questions and stuff after, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike's. So well, my job is to talk about lipid testing, and I'm supposed to have the other side where we don't really do much lipid testing at all. And I always think when I, think, when I talk about lipids, there's lots of good evidence about the management of lipids. And, the, the research is actually quite profound. We don't need much more research there at all. What we need is a lot better interpretation. That's where we fall apart. So um, I'm Mike Allen. As mentioned, I'm a family doctor and an associate professor. I've never received funding from industry for anything except when I first graduated 15 years ago, I went to a drug dinner. It was clopidogrel, and I wasn't welcome after a while because I kept asking questions. So the chicken was better than the, than the actual talk. And then I find these new slides from the College of Family Practice a little bit silly, but I'll try and get through them. So who financially supported the program? The college, uh, the BC College, that means you guys actually supported it. And who gave in-kind support? Well, how does that work? I, I guess BC government did. They built roads that got us here. It's just, anyhow, um, so BC government, or the, uh, the BC College paid for my plane ticket and uh, one night stay, but... Unfortunately, I didn't order any movies, so they'll, that, won't be on, uh, that won't be on the bill. And I'll try not to talk, I love this too, how do I mitigate these? Well, I won't talk about the college anymore. Um, so cholesterol, I thought we'd do a brief pictorial history of cholesterol. So there it is. Now, how many of you use a picture like this in practice every day with your patients? And you say, this is cholesterol, and it's the face of evil. Okay? None of us, I don't know why people show pictures of of drugs because they're not useful for any of us in real practice. But anyhow, we all know, we've all seen pictures like this where cholesterol builds up in the arteries and people can really see that. Most of the general public will have seen this because they, and they'll know because it's like their pipes at home, they get plugged up, they get broken, maybe they explode. It's very scary. So that leads us to worrying about things, which is also what we love to do in medicine, get people worried about things. So we want to follow and, and monitor our cholesterol, and we put labels on everything to say how much cholesterol is in it. And not to mention that, but we also now want to test it. And not just test cholesterol, but you can actually test it at home. How many of you knew that? You can get a home test kit. It's not only a home test kit, now they've developed cholesterol track. 
you can now track your cholesterol. So if you decide to eat an egg this morning, go test your cholesterol. Let's see what it is. Are you having a bad day? Do you have a headache? Are you losing hair? Check your cholesterol. It's important. And so you get lots of test strips and just keep monitoring it. Goodness knows it's the key to all health. But I'm suggesting to you that maybe all of this in 10 to 20 years when we finally start to accept what the evidence is saying, it's all just kind of a classic fairy tale. So let me take you through the evidence first. So what does cholesterol tell us? There's no doubt that cholesterol in cohort data is a good predictor of outcomes. In other words, if you look at someone's cholesterol or their low HDL, it is a good predictor of whether they will have a cardiovascular event. Itself is a relatively good predictor, and when added to other things in a risk calculator, it helps a lot. And as Kevin said, risk calculators are far from perfect. We just completed a pretty big research project on them, and we show that only one in every three agree with each other. But the, but the point is that they still are better than us taking a rough guess. What's interesting, though, and what you might not have heard, is in some populations, particularly the elderly, low cholesterol in some studies has been associated with worse outcomes. That's not treated cholesterol, that's just lower cholesterol. So, what I wanted to do next is talk to you about what do we know about treating cholesterol. And there is a whole lot of different things we can use to treat cholesterol. And I've made up this busy chart for you, it's, it's going to be available for you. But I don't expect you to read it here. What I want to do now is focus on, of all of the things that are out there, from omega-3s to statins to what have you, what actually works to change cholesterol. Well, there are three main things that work really well. If we start at the bottom, it's statins. And they really, all they do mostly is reduce LDL. That's kind of their thing. Acetamide does it about the same as a statin. Okay? And then the last one is torcitrabib. And that's the one Kevin was, I think, alluding to. It's a drug that uh, is probably the lipid king. It takes your HDL. Let's say your HDL was 1. It would turn it into 1.7. If your LDL was 4, it would take it down to about a 3. Okay? So it is, there's no drug that we have or had that is as effective. But let's look at drugs now that actually work to do something, or interventions, because there's diet as well, of course. So these are the ones that do something. Okay? You can see there's not many on that list. Torsitrabib is up at the top, and it's colored red because it does something all right. It kills people. Okay? So it's the lipid king, and it has the worst outcomes. It reduces, oh, sorry, it increases cardiovascular disease and increases mortality. The relative effect rates are right there for you, okay? At the end of this slideshow, I won't go over it. There's all of the references for where this comes from. There's the statin trials. You can see there, statins reduce cardiovascular disease by about 25%. In the best case scenario, it's probably around 14% for mortality. That would be in secondary prevention in particular. And the Mediterranean diet, it does pretty much nothing for cholesterol numbers. And yet it consistently now in three clinical trials in all sorts of different populations has reduced cardiovascular events. And in high-risk people also reduces mortality. Okay? So you've got one thing that actually is correlated to LDL and cholesterol levels, and it works, that's statins, and then everything else doesn't make any sense. So the idea that simply reducing cholesterol is important to outcomes is fallacy. It doesn't really work. So is cholesterol needed to prescribe a statin? Well, let's go over that. In primary prevention, what we really talk about and what Kevin alluded to or talked about is that it's all about risk. So I want to give you some examples of trials that have actually showed this. An earlier trial called ASCOT, which was done in Scotland, picked people with a relatively low cholesterol for that population. It was around 3.4 LDL. And yet, what did they have? They were actually hypertensives. Can you imagine in your practice seeing someone come in and, I've been monitoring your blood pressure, it's 155 over 90, so we're going to start you on a statin. That's kind of what these guys were doing. They were saying, your blood pressure's high, so let's start you on a statin, because it's a risk drug. And the same is true in Jupiter where they randomize people based on risk. A lot of talk was given to that about HSCRP, but even if you remove HSCRP, the average patient had a moderate risk level, which we know will benefit from treatment of statins. In the TNT trial, this is called the Treat to New Targets trial. They didn't treat to new targets. They didn't do anything like that. They gave 10 milligrams of atorvastatin or 80. 
If you were in the 10 milligram group and your cholesterol, your LDL went below two, they didn't stop the medicine or back off. And if you didn't get to target in the 80, they didn't add more. It's not a target. It was a misnomer. And actually, many people misunderstood the trial because of that title. But it doesn't matter because what they found was at the higher dose, even in those with a low LDL to start with, they did better. So in summary, trials enroll people based on risk, not based on cholesterol. And the risk is the biggest predictor of your likelihood to benefit or a patient's. So you really don't need cholesterol. You just need to understand if a patient's at risk or not. So do we need to target cholesterol? Well, Kevin talked about this already. And quite frankly, you don't need to. There's no trials that have really targeted cholesterol. We say, I say that, but actually there are two trials. One that looked at diabetics and was a target trial across the board, which I'll mention in a second. And then there was one small trial which didn't find benefit in a very uh, specific population of aboriginals in, um, uh, I think it was Arizona. But basically, what I want you to do is go away with stop worrying about targets. The targets are ridiculous. If you look at the statin trials where they gave the absolute most statin possible, so 80 milligrams of atorvastatin, less than 50% of patients actually got to an LDL less than 2. The reason we're not hitting targets is it's not possible to hit the targets. It's not some failure of family physicians or their patients. It's a failure of those who made these guidelines. Okay? And if you look at the, the, the targets, even a whole, basing your management of patients on targets, a, a trial did do this called Steno. It aggressively managed targets across five different areas. One patient, 1% 1 of patients hit all five targets. And the whole trial was designed around hitting targets. So stop feeling guilty about not hitting targets with your patients. Because it probably doesn't even matter. If you start a low dose or moderate dose statin, you get about a 25% reduction in event rates, a relative reduction. If you maximize that dose, you get another 10% on top of it. It doesn't really matter what your LDL target is, because if you started high and you got lower, or you started low and got lower still, you're getting the same benefit. So targeting doesn't matter. So what do studies say about testing? And, here, and, and Kevin alluded to this too, which I think is really interesting for us to understand. Let's say you started someone on a statin and they're on 20 milligrams of atorvastatin, and you decide to bump them up to 40, you're going to retest their cholesterol. The amount of change in cholesterol that you can expect from that bump up is less than 7%. The variability around the number is 7 to 11%. So any change you see could be random chance. Only the first dose of statin can actually be perceived in a cholesterol measurement. Okay. And many people who've looked at this say, if you're low risk, you shouldn't be having your cholesterol done any more than every 8 to 10 years. And if you're talking about monitoring to see if people are compliant, it's not as good as just asking people. Okay, So we really don't need to test for that reason either. So how do we figure out who gets a statin, though? Well, maybe we don't need cholesterol at all. Maybe we need some kind of superhero power like this. Now, I don't think this guy is going to be the one to tell you whether to use a cholesterol drug or not, but he does have something that would help you. Obesity. You can actually use obesity or BMI as a predictor and substitute that into any risk calculator uh, for cholesterol, and it works just as well. So if you don't want to order cholesterol ever again, I would say that you could probably get away with that by using one of these models. Okay? And there's lots of them. You just, if you want to look it up, you just Google cardiovascular risk prediction with BMI, and there's a whole bunch of options for you. But I'm a doctor and a family physician, so we're all about compromise. We do that all the time with our patients. So can I see a point in ordering cholesterol? Yes. I would say pick someone who you think is at higher risk. Kevin alluded to this, and I don't think we have much better information than what the guidelines recommend at this stage. And there's no evidence to support that, by the way. You're just kind of picking people you think. And family doctors, all doctors, are pretty good at assessing that. You can, they're pretty good at saying, yeah, that person's probably at moderate risk or something like that. Then measure their cholesterol. If you, if you feel a need to use cholesterol, measure that cholesterol. Figure out their risk. Tell them their benefit and let them decide. And I gave you some examples. The easiest way is remember that it's a 25% reduction. Most of you have bought something in your life that's for sale. And, you've, and you've, so you've looked at something that's $10. And it said 25% off. 
you knew it was 750 then. Okay? It's the same thing here. If your baseline risk is 16% and it's 25% off that, the risk is now 12%. Okay? That's all there is to it. So here's my bottom line wrap up. Of all the cholesterol drugs, only statins work. The lipid hypothesis really lacks evidence. Um, cardiovascular history, if you have a cardiovascular event, get those patients on the highest dose of statin they can tolerate. You can start low and titrate up, or you can be like the CCU and dump them on the highest dose and then hand them back to us. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was a slight there. It was ever so subtle. Um, and if it's primary prevention, look at baseline risk. People, generally we think, and this is a rough guess, you can offer it at 8%, to 10, but when somebody's risk is getting up in the 10% area over 10 years, offer them a statin and tell them the benefit. And if you want to, and remember, the research shows that if we tell people their risk benefit, they'll make better decisions for themselves, okay? So it's very important. Just some examples of readings that will be in the notes and then my references. All right, thank you.